My name is Sean Casey. I am the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. Uh, as you can see, only four-fifths of us are here, and I will explain that. Uh, E.J. Dion is on his way from uh, Reagan Airport in an Uber, and with luck, he's just going to slide in very unobtrusively and just appear there in, in the last chair uh, in, in a couple of moments. Let me uh, take a moment or two very quickly to give you the run of show, and it's my goal to pivot to you, the audience, for questions as soon as possible. Now, I've got a, I've got a referee, a, an obstreperous crowd of very smart people here uh, who are experts, but we, we have a few things we want to get out of the way, but then we want to really field uh, your questions. Before I go any further, I, I'm supposed to announce uh, for John Carr, who is on his way if he's not here, uh, on November 19th, the, his initiative on Catholic social thought is running an amazing event on the topic of faith and the faithful in the midterm elections. Uh, so he wanted, he's got, we have flyers here, or will by the, by the time we're done, pick up that flyer, and we will not exhaust all the questions and answers tonight. And John has put together also a, an all-star panel. So if you don't get enough tonight, come back on the 19th. I believe that's a, a Monday evening, on November 19th. Pick up a flyer, and you'll have all the information you need to, to make sure you're, you're here. I'm going to pitch a first question, and we're going to run down the row, and everybody's going to take a, a, a swing at that. But let me also set a couple of ground rules. Uh, we thrive in these kind of panels on questions and answers from the audience. Uh, I'm kind of old school, though, in that as a professor, I want questions. So I, I'm hoping that you will disguise your sermons, your jeremiads, uh, your statements, your manifestos as a succinct question. And the benefit is the shorter your questions are, the more answers we're going to be able to get tonight. We're on a fairly tight schedule. We're hoping to be done by six. Uh, so the briefer you are and the less loquacious you are, the sooner we can get the answers and we can get more questions in. I will also interrupt you if the sermon gets too long. Uh, and I have a bit of a reputation here, which I want to preserve, that really we, we want to have as much back and forth as possible. So when, you, uh, when we get to the question and answer period, simply raise your hand. I will acknowledge you. Uh, a microphone will come. So wait until you get a handheld microphone from one of the, the, the staffers here. Uh, tell us who you are. Tell us the, uh, your institutional identification, and then please give us a quick, well-crafted, incisive question, and then we will uh, proceed to, to try and answer as many of those as possible. So EJ will be, be joining us uh, shortly, but in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me take a second and introduce uh, our panelists, and then we will jump into the first question. To my immediate left is Rebecca Linder Blatchley, and she is the Director of Government Relations for the Episcopal Church. EJ uh, is well known to everyone here. Uh, he's a scholar and commentator on religion in US politics. He's a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center and university professor in the foundations of democracy and culture teaching in Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy and our government department. Uh, next is Professor Clyde Wilcox. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I got out of order. Uh, Clyde's at the end. Uh, he's a professor in Georgetown University's government department, and he's taught a class supported through the Berkeley Center's Doyle Seminars Project. And then uh, in the middle is Eric Patterson. He's a research fellow at the Berkeley Center and a professor at and the former dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Welcome to, to all three of you, and thanks for coming. So let's, uh, let's jump in. The first, and we're just going to go down uh, in order here. The first question is simply a, a general one. Where did you see uh, religious dynamics or religion at play in the midterm election? So, Rebecca. Sure. Thank you, Sean, um, for hosting and moderating this event. Thanks all for being here. Um, I think we saw that religion mattered a lot in several different ways. Um, the first way is that there was just a fair amount of media coverage about the role of religion in these elections with the sense that maybe in the 2016 elections uh, the media missed a piece of it. And in particular, I would say the white evangelical vote. I'm sure others will speak more about it, but there was a sense of continued bewilderment as to how it could be that white evangelicals could maintain a level of support um, for President Trump and then by extension the Republican Party um, in this election. Uh, we saw that 
support stayed pretty steady, actually, with almost no change um, for President Trump from 2016 to present among the white evangelicals, so um, worth noting that. At the same time, there were very high hopes for the religious left. There's been an ongoing discussion about whether there's been a resurgence or a reemergence or a revitalization of um, progressive religious groups or groups who are more um, centrist even, kind of in, contra you know, in contrast to um, the more conservative Christian evangelicals. And so we've heard a lot about Reverend Barber, certainly, and uh, the Poor People's Campaign. We saw a lot of different voter mobilization efforts underway this election cycle. Um, the Episcopal Church led a Vote Faithfully campaign. We worked with groups like Lawyers and Callers, which sought to bring mm -hmm. clergy members and um, lawyers to monitor at the polling stations. Uh, there was Vote Common Good, nuns on the bus again. Um, so we saw a lot of religious leaders arguing that people needed to vote their values and vote their conscience. Um, one thing that we can be certain of is that people have different values and different consciences because that was the same messaging that we heard among um, folks across the political spectrum. Um, but I think it is a shift among some in the um, mainline traditions and, and other groups that are understood to be more on the left to be talking so much about values and really try to reclaim that. Um, so did the hopes of the religious left materialize? I'd say yes and no. We did see higher voter turnout than we've seen um, in any midterm election since 1966 with 47%. And there was a shift among the voting patterns of mainline Protestants, actually. So that's the only group where there was a shift in um, approval ratings for President Trump. So the approval rating dropped 9% among mainline Protestants. And with other groups, it was mostly level. Uh, Again, unclear whether that's because of the um, exhortations of religious leaders to really connect with voting for the common good and understanding that to mean um, not the traditional pro-life issues we often hear about among some more um, conservative groups, but things like feeding um, the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and um, maybe we can get more into immigration policy and what that's looked like and the refugee resettlement issues and how that's rallied up a lot of Christian groups and faith-based community who are involved in the work of refugee resettlement and, and the, all the challenges the, the, that program has faced over the past two years since that election. Um, so I'll leave it there to make sure that our colleagues have time to speak. Thanks. Thank you. Here. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to be back on the Georgetown campus. And on this question, I'll speak primarily about evangelicals um, and then say something about the relationship with, with President Trump. The first thing that struck me in looking at survey data from the, from the Pew Forum, and this is freely available, is the statistic about 75%. So about 75% of conservative Christians, evangelicals, conservative Catholics and the like, about 75% voted uh, for the Republican Party in this election, and about 75% of people who have some other religious affiliation, so nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S, not the nuns on the bus, but it, people of no religious affiliation, people on the religious left, uh, people of an, uh, a non-Christian faith, uh, those people typically up to three quarters of the time voted against the president. So it, it's actually a really easy number to remember, about three quarters one way or the other. Um, it, it's, it's more interesting, I think, when you look at religious uh, practice or religiosity, because it's a, it's, that number stays very high for people who go to church uh, or to a house of worship, uh, but specifically for Christians who go one or more times a week, it's again that 75 or 80 percent number regardless of denomination. It's kind of an interesting one. What about the president and, and, and evangelicals? Uh, there has been a claim that perhaps evangelicals shouldn't support the president for a variety of reasons. And I would argue uh, Tony Perkins, the president of the Family Research Council, said some time ago, I, I don't support President Trump for his values, I support him because we have shared concerns. So not shared values, we have shared concerns. And uh, candidate Trump signaled in a very transactional way during the campaign, I will support these things that are important to evangelical and conservative Christians. He named the vice president, who's a well-known evangelical and former governor of Indiana. He, uh, published a list of the types of Supreme Court candidates by name uh, in August of that year. No one had done that before, and they were very conservative candidates. 
He said things about religious liberty domestically. He said things about pro-life. And he uh, said a lot about support for Israel. And he's maintained, he's, he's kept those promises when it comes to policy. So I think more important than anything, when we think about evangelical kind of support for this president, we would recognize it as a transactional relationship, one where maybe there's not always affinity of values, but when it comes to these shared concerns and the way those policies would be into, put into practice, there really hasn't been someone who's practiced a social conservative set of policies uh, since at least Ronald Reagan or before in terms of making it happen in Washington. Great, thank you, Eric. Well, see, EJ's not here, so I'll slow down because we don't <laughs> want to be done before he gets here, right? Yeah. So um, I think actually one of the more interesting stories that I'm actually not going to tell you was the, the use of black churches throughout Georgia and uh, Florida. Yeah. I know a lot of people down there in those churches were doing an amazing get out the vote drive, right? That's right? And one of the sermons in one of the churches where a friend of mine attended, someone was assigned in each pew to call everybody on, mm -hmm. you know, Tuesday morning and make sure everyone in their pew had, uh, had turned out to vote or whatever. But I, most of my career I've been writing about white evangelicals because that's the tradition I grew up in. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. Um, take a slightly different position uh, than Eric, but uh, in, the, in the spirit of friendly uh, discussion. So the Pew survey shows in 2018 the white evangelicals were 25% of the electorate. That's been true for the last four election cycles. Mm -hmm. But that's weird because they're actually a shrinking portion of the population. So that says that there are 15% of the population, 25% of the electorate. And when I first started studying evangelicals, they turned out less than the rest of the population because the theology of premillennial dispensationalism, Christ is coming again very soon, we don't want to be caught up in politics, we want to be saving souls. So that's a really remarkable thing. And then there's 75% has been the same number in the last four election cycles for Republicans. So it doesn't seem to matter who the candidate is, doesn't seem to matter the character of the candidate or the issue positions of the candidate. It's just pretty much always 75%. I did a phone call to some friends out in Nevada who said, there's no exit poll data on this, but they said that the dead brothel owner who, <laughs> whose last appearance was with a porn star at a party also received overwhelming support from white evangelicals, right? So at some level, it seems like 75% is the number, right? <laughs> no matter what, right? Now, how could that sort of thing happen? Well, partisanship is a habit, right? Yeah. And so I think initially for the average uh, evangelical, it was a transactional relationship. How are we going to reverse Roe? Democrats aren't going to do it. Republicans right. might. Let's, you know, let's do this as a transactional thing. At the elite level, it probably still is. Like a Tony Perkins is probably still saying, okay, I'll make a deal with whatever <laughs> to get this uh, to work. But for the average rank and file, uh, evangelical, they've been Republicans for a long time. And what we know about uh, strong partisanship is that you begin to listen to your party leaders and they begin to persuade you, right? So Bill Clinton, when he took his position on gays in the military, you know, he lost some popularity, but he persuaded some Democrats, right? And when uh, Obama evolved on LGBT rights, you know, Democrats kind of evolved with them. And so what I see is I trace the attitudes of rank and file evangelicals is the beginning of some attitude change on immigration, on a variety of other issues. Uh, they're becoming more loyal Republicans and consistent in their attitudes, much more conservative on economics than they were in the 1980s, for example. So I think of them more as super Republicans. Once upon a time, I thought of them as people outside the political system having a critique of society and the party. Now I think see them as, as really strong uh, loyalists in the party. Um, now, but if, I think if we had this uh, Pew data, we could go deeper into it, I think we'd probably see some fissures. All we see now is the crosstabs, right? right? We can't say, what about evangelical women in the North? We can't say, what about young women? So I'm gonna talk now about other surveys I've, I've analyzed in the past, and, uh, and also some of the activism I saw this time. So in Northern Virginia, there was some nascent organizing by white evangelical Republicans on behalf of Democratic candidates. Mm -hmm. And it was done over the issue of children in cages, of respect for women, the environment, and a number of issues. They didn't do this eagerly, right? They did this because they felt the party was not uh, taking the position that they thought was consistent with their faith. Survey data shows to me that young evangelicals, 
really have a different set of issue positions on several issues than their older counterparts. They have evolved along with the rest of society on LGBT rights. Even among young, frequent attending, Bible-believing evangelical Christians, white evangelical Christians, you now have a bare majority uh, favoring same-sex marriage in a number of surveys. They have especially evolved on things like the environment. They're much more liberal than their parents on immigration. Where they're not more liberal is abortion. They're actually, if anything, more pro-life than their parents. Um, but um, when I talk to them and, and when people have done focus groups, they're more likely to see the U.S. as a mission field and not a battlefield, mm -hmm. and they're less likely to think that partisan politics has really paid off for them, right? That the Republican Party has not enacted the values that they, they really, um, and so they see that it's sort of like a, a false uh, dream, right? Um, as, the, as the evangelicals have become so clearly identified with the uh, Republican Party, a couple of things have happened. First of all, um, uh, a number of young evangelicals are staying in the faith but trying to refocus the faith. Uh, but a number of them have left evangelical denominations. Some of them still, in surveys, would show evangelical doctrine. Right. They believe the Bible is the literal word or inerrant word of God. They believe you must be born again. They attend church regularly. But they don't call themselves evangelical anymore because that label seems to make them to be politicized, right? Uh, some of them have joined non-denominational churches because they have a, a more inclusive kind of doctrine. Some have moved to the main line, and some have actually stopped attending church altogether. Pew reports that about one-third of those now who have been raised in white evangelical households have left that faith. Now, for the longest time, when I was studying uh, you know, religious groups in American politics, it was the main line that was, was dropping off, right? They weren't keeping their children, but evangelicals were growing as a share of the population because they kept their kids and they had shorter generations. They had children younger in their life cycle. Uh, that's no longer true, right? Um, and uh, a recent book, a book that's coming out soon by Paul DeJoup suggests that in the last two years, there have been across the age spectrum, moderates who have been leaving some of the stronger fundamentalist churches because of the embrace of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The idea that they go to church for spiritual solace and they don't want to hear something that's inconsistent with uh, what they believe. Um, meanwhile, as evangelicals are dropping as a share of the population, the fastest growing religious group in America is the unaffiliated, right? And they're up to 17% in the last survey. Um, and, and among the young, it's, it's, you know, in the 40s. So the unaffiliated is a pretty vague group, and there's a lot of uh, different types of people in it. Uh, one of my graduate students uh, has written a dissertation about this. So there's a group that attend church, but they don't really belong to that church. They don't feel like that church is them, so they're not going to call themselves Methodists or Baptists or whatever. Uh, there's another group who uh, attend non-denominational churches. There's another group who, who doesn't attend church anymore, but they read their Bible and they pray, and they're still pretty religious, um, but they're not, they don't feel at home in churches. Uh, there's another set that is uh, calling themselves spiritual but not religious, and there's another set that's just pretty much not religious at all. But that particular group, that, that, that's, uh, evangelicals are dropping, right? They're down to 15%. In this particular election, non-affiliated passed them, 17% of the electorate. Um, I would say that Eric makes a really good point that, ironically, really, because I don't think of Trump as a very religious man, um, white evangelicals have achieved their greatest political influence in this administration. Mm -hmm. I have, I have written in one of my articles that this is like the last temptation of Christ. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that at some point, it's like, you really want to get, you know, how do you, what do you have to do to get power, right? So this is me t talking as a Christian, less than a political scientist. Um, but the, the price of this has been to alienate some of the younger people, to alienate some of the moderates, and to um, end up uh, losing some of the people in, in their faith tradition. So um, finally, I just, uh, I, I was on Facebook this morning and, and three of my friends had posted a picture, I don't know how many of you have very conservative friends, but of, uh, of uh, Trump, it, it's clearly not a transactional relationship. Trump's sitting at the White House, he's, he's uh, writing something and Jesus is there in ghostly form with his arms around him, guiding his hand, right? And so in each case I posted, is this his resignation letter? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. 
I understand EJ is minutes away, uh, so we will, uh, I'm gonna go to the next question and we'll let EJ catch up. So, uh, so I, I guess my, my second question is, okay, looking towards the next two years with, with the, uh, the recasting of, of control of, of the Congress, are there, are there openings you can see here that say are values driven or related or are we going to get two more years of vexation and gridlock and this is, this is looking into the future sort of in the crystal ball, but I'm seeing, what, what do you see now in terms of, of the outcomes legislatively looking forward? I think we will see a pretty high degree of gridlock, just we've seen a pretty high degree of gridlock and there was a unified House, Senate, and presidency, um, and now we have a divided Congress. Um, we also saw a lot of moderate Republicans um, lose. So I think that that has shifted the dynamic among the Republican Party and what that will mean on the House side especially. Um, half of the Republican members of the Climate Caucus lost in, the, in their election, which is wow. pretty astonishing. Um, the only, I think, Republican introduced legislation that was addressing climate change um, was Congressman Corbello. He lost. Um, we applauded that as a, uh, the Episcopal Church. Climate is one of our big advocacy priorities and environmental issues more broadly, care of creation. Uh, so I think that my biggest concern, this is sort of an answer, um, but my biggest concern is that issues that used to be values-based, that used to have bipartisan support, so, or that we hoped could achieve bipartisan support because of their importance, like environmental issues, clean air, clean water, however we framed it, whatever language we used, that they could get bipartisan support mm -hmm. and that those issues would move. What I think is really concerning now is that we've seen refugee resettlement be an issue that um, Democrats are for and Republicans have not necessarily been as vocal about supporting and those that did, again, some of those folks lost their elections too. Mm -hmm. So I think for those of us who work in faith-based advocacy, what would be a worst case scenario would be if all these issues become politicized even further and then there becomes almost no common ground. And I think immigration, we've seen that too, the attitudes shifting where there used to be bipartisan support for some kind of comprehensive immigration reform, kind of what that looked like. There was a lot of um, latitude that would need to be addressed to come up with the right kind of legislation. I think around Dreamers and DACA, something similar. Will we be able to come up with a solution for that? I don't know if the Senate will be able to take action and move on it. Um, so there's some issues I, I want to watch and, mm -hmm. and see that especially Republicans don't get pushed out and t into feeling like they aren't able to take action on something, again, where there may have been in the past a, a consensus on it. Uh, there's always hope, I think, that there can be an infrastructure package. Um, it's hard to know how that will get paid for and what it'll work, but we've seen, at least in the past uh, 48 hours, that there's been some comments that that might be something that could move. Um, we, in the Episcopal Church, had a, um, along with our partners in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and Bread for the World and others, uh, a 20-month campaign called For Such a Time as This, a campaign of prayer, fasting, and advocacy, uh, looking at issues that uh, were facing Americans living in poverty. So we had all kinds of different intersectional issues around veterans and homelessness and food assistance. Um, and one of them was on infrastructure and spending and infrastructure. And somehow, after months of not having necessarily that much traction, the infrastructure one hit and was in Politico, and all of a sudden all the infrastructure lobby groups are reaching out to us, like we love that the Episcopal Church is on board with infrastructure. <laughs> so we are excited to partner with groups on infrastructure if we can, um, again, recognizing that there's equity dimensions to that, certainly racial justice can be looked at, you know, communities who are living in poverty and don't have access can be impacted by the kind of infrastructure projects we put together. So mm -hmm. that would be an area of hope that we've heard talk could, mm -hmm. could be um, something that would move forward. Cool. Which part of the question? It's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, the last 48 hours, first of all, all of the predictions about a big blue wave didn't happen, right? When you look at, over the past century, the midterm elections for first-term presidents, uh, Donald Trump and his party fared very well. Uh, the loss of, of three dozen seats is, is small compared to President Obama, 64 seats, Bill Clinton, 54 seats. As you go back to first-term presidents, actually President Trump did quite well. Um, 
In fact, the last time that there was a gain of this nature on the Senate side for the president's party in the first term for midterms elections, uh, remember GOP won three, a net of three, was 1962, JFK netted four. So it's actually a pretty amazing set of statistics in terms of what has happened all over the country. Uh, Republicans still have almost twice as many state legislature houses. It's something like 64 to 37 or 62 to 37. Um, even though they had slight losses, they won some key governorships, although they didn't win all of them. So places like Florida, Ohio, Texas, Georgia that are important for them going into redistricting in the 2010, uh, 2020 elections and things. Um, Republicans have a, uh, don't feel nearly as bad as they were expecting to feel, and I think Democrats don't feel nearly as good as they had hoped to feel going into this election. Now that being said, the, it is a question about whether or not divided government can produce, and certainly there's a lot of concern about the level of acrimony. I, I was very worried last week when one of our most famous Hollywood uh, actors said, if the Democrats don't win, I'm gonna be out in the streets and there'll be blood in the streets. And that's a famous, there'll be blood in the streets. And he was calling for that level of activism. This is a famous Hollywood actor who you all know. You've seen him play the Secretary of State and the President of the United States in a lot of movies. So it's really chilling, I think, across the mm -hmm. spectrum, mm -hmm. across the spectrum, these types of claims in a lot of different corners uh, going into this election. And by the way, I'm proud as an American that it's a pretty quiet day today in the country, I mean, politically speaking, right? I mean, there's other countries where things don't go the way people like and they become civil wars and things. And, and once again, we've, we've had a pacific uh, election. Now that being said, are there places where I see that there can be work together across party lines? Joaquin, um, oh, what's, um, what's his last name? Castro. The, uh, Castro, Joaquin Castro, the, the Democratic Congressman, from, excuse me, from Texas last night said uh, on television, uh, you know, I think what the American people have told us is they want the two parties to work together. And I think that that was a very powerful mm -hmm. statement. Sean and I were talking this afternoon, and, and I think we agree with you, Rebecca, that, that infrastructure is a nonpartisan thing in some ways that I think they could cut a deal. Now, the left flank of the Democratic Party is going to have to give up some things, maybe, on the environment to move infrastructure along. That's been a big impediment. And Republicans on the other side may have to give up some things in, in an approach to labor mm -hmm. issues. Uh, but, I, but I think that probably infrastructure is the most likely or a narrowly crafted something in healthcare. Mm. So, thanks. So I'd have a slightly different take on blue wave, ripple, whatever. Uh, the average midterm loss of uh, uh, President's Party is 22. Looks like we're headed for about 35. So 1994 and 2010 were huge. You know, 2010 in particular, tidal wave, right? But this is bigger than 2006. It's like the third biggest in the last 20 years. So it's, it's actually not a small, small wave. Um, the, uh, but we have a, we have a split, uh, split control of the, of the Congress. So in terms of the issues I've been talking about, the fact that Republicans have a bigger majority in the Senate means they're going to be able to control court appointments. Uh, the good news from my point of view is maybe they won't be in such a hurry. They were sticking on some lower court judges there that had that really had no business being on the court, right? They now they have two years they could take their time, look for a better better justice. With Ruth Bader Ginsburg falling today and cracking three rips, though, yeah. I'm a little nervous about that. But um, so uh, so what can we agree on? And I think it's kind of a sad idea. I agree with everyone infrastructure, but what can we agree on? We could build some bridges and roads, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd kind of hope we could do better than that, right? But, uh, but honestly, I'm not sure. I'm guessing we're going to be caught up in investigations of, of Trump and the firing of the, you know, this is gonna be the next two years, right? I think, um, now could I imagine a different world? Imagine the president decided he wanted to come in and take, it, it would require presidential leadership to pull this off, right? He would have to be sitting down and cutting a deal with Nancy Pelosi and with uh, the leadership in the, you know, uh, back in the day, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill used to have cognac and a cigar every Friday. And Tip O'Neill was a really liberal Democrat. Reagan was a pretty conservative Republican. And they said, what can we agree on, right? And they ended up agreeing on a fair number of things. And once or twice, Tip O'Neill delivered Democratic votes to help something pass, right? So it shouldn't be impossible. I don't see Trump playing that role. Right, I mean, I just watched the press conference uh, the other day. It didn't seem like that's the kind of man he is, right? Um, 
A lot of people of good faith in Congress of both sides, right, who really wish it was better. But uh, picking up on her point, you know, we lost six moderates in the Senate, right, three in each party. McCain died, Flake retired, Corker retired, Heidkamp, uh, you know, McCaskill and Donnelly. Those are six of the most moderate members. And the people who replaced them in each case are more, are more uh, extreme. The, uh, we were talking earlier about who, re who was it who beat the Republicans, and some of them were more to the left, some are more centrist, and so it's kind of a mixed bag. But uh, what the exit polls show is most Democrats really want to investigate Donald Trump. And uh, if, we, if they do that, then you know Donald Trump doesn't take that well. So I'm guessing it's going to be really hard to get past that personality animosity. But I, I do think, in the end, there are more things we could compromise than just building bridges. But building bridges would be good, because our bridges are crumbling and our airports are <laughs> falling apart. And so if, we have to, if that's all we can do, then let's do it, right? All right. Well, I had one more question, but I'm going to follow my own advice. We're going to pivot to the audience now. So we have, a, I think, a couple of microphones. Uh, if you've got a question, raise your hand. Remember the rules. Ask a question, but tell us who you are and what your uh, identification is. We, we have a hand over here uh, on the, where is that? Here we go. Here comes our microphone. Hi, my name is Nikki Toyamasito. I'm the executive director of Evangelicals for Social Action. And I would identify myself as a diverse evangelical. Do you have any comments about how race as a subculture within some of these faith traditions either tacked with kind of uh, the white majority or where they may have gone a little bit differently? We've been trying to wait for EJ. Because <laughs> he, he has a great presentation. He published an op-ed today. He wants to answer your question. <laughs> Let me just say one thing about that. You know, when, when we, we have white evangelicals as a category. And when we first started having that as a category, I think there was kind of an assumption among some political scientists that white evangelicals are evangelical and black evangelicals are black, right? That race trumps for minorities and faith trumps for whites, and I would really, really reject that, right? I, you know, I attend a black church outside of Richmond. Boy, that's a really intensely a religious community. They do all kinds of social action based on their faith, right? Um, many of the larger evangelical churches now are really diverse, right? They've got Latinos, they've got Asians, they've got African Americans, but uh, you know, churches remain one of the most segregated parts of American society. And so same Bible, same belief in that Bible, but what verses and what part are we focusing on really takes a different interpretation depending on the tradition. I think it's a really important question ar around also, right, what the polling data shows, how we ask questions, how we conceive of them. Um, I just finished reading that Melanie um, McAllister. McAllister's book about um, a, a global history of American evangelicalism, which really contests the notion that there's just white evangelicals and somehow other Christians in a separate group and really um, broadens that out and also shows or explores how um, the, the different strains within evangelical thought that are more oriented towards social justice, that are more oriented towards evangelization and proselytization. Um, so I think that there's more to be done. I think there is a limit around the polling data, both historically and present tense, that kind of muddies a lot of this. Um, I know that within the Episcopal Church, at least, there's a very strong emphasis. One of our three priorities is, is reconciliation with a particular focus on racial reconciliation. and. Uh, one way that we're doing that is through partnerships with groups like AME and others um, to look back. And I, I think that may also be shifting some of the thinking or, or elevating racial justice uh, among the minds of some Episcopalians who maybe wouldn't have looked through the lens um, of race and their religious tradition, their religious history as much as they, they could have and should have. And I think it's a really good trend to look at the history and uh, expand out how maybe we're thinking and categorizing. My only intervention would be to say that one of the most interesting things I think in global Christianity is the way that socially conservative people around the world in evangelical denominations are putting pressure either on their, their home mainline denomination in the United States, like the United Methodists, for instance, uh, or breaking away, such as has happened with various forms of Anglicanism, to, uh, to assert pressure towards a more socially conservative ethic uh, which transcends boundaries. That, and it'll be very, that, that's been going on now for at least 15 years. It'll be interesting to see 
the role that that will continue to play. Uh, will it be that evangelicals in the United States look for spiritual leadership, at least conservative spiritual leadership, actually outside of the U.S., where the U.S. had provided that in the past? The Melanie McAllister book, The Kingdom of God Knows No Boundaries, is a superb book. It really is the first attempt to write a global history of American evangelicalism, and it goes back to the 60s down to contemporary times, and it's, uh, and here is the prodigal commentator. Uh, welcome, EJ. It's great to have you. You. Nice. How are you? Good to see you. Glad you made it. How are you? Good. So, EJ, we're, we're going to, we've pivoted to the, to the audience, but let's pivot back to you, okay? Yeah, so, I apologize for being late. I ask you to pray that I might rid myself of a certain hostility I feel toward Uber at the moment. <laughs> uh, it was a nightmare getting right. here, and I am so sorry I am late, and no, I'm no. sorry I now feel like 10 times dumber because I know how much intelligence I missed while I was no. trying. Uh, uh -huh. to get here. Um, I, so I'm just going to jump in yeah, so just with take, take the first an question. essentially do you provocative see set of comments um, where I want to argue that I've, like everybody on this stage in one way or another, I've been obsessed with this issue, studying it, thinking about it, uh, the relationship of religion and politics for 30, 40 years, you know, basically ever since I was pretty little. And I've taught courses on it. Uh, I have uh, talked to students about it endlessly. Uh, and I still care about it very much. Uh, I am coming to the conclusion that at this moment uh, in our history, religion actually does not matter at all. That religion is often given as, or is given as a reason, uh, but it's actually a rationale. Uh, that people are voting their identities and dressing them up in the decent drapery of religion. Um, I did a little blog for uh, the uh, GU Politics site last week uh, where we, my assistant Amber Hurley, Amber, are you still here? I hope it's uh, Amber was here earlier, I know. And, uh, that um, where we looked at a lot of data, and if you just take a look at white evangelical Christians, who are they? Um, white evangelical Christians are substantially older than the population uh, as a whole. In a recent PRI study, 45% of the sample was over 50, 60% of white evangelicals were over 50. They are, by definition, white, uh, and um, they are also disproportionately Southern. Um, in this sample, 50% of white evangelicals were Southern compared to 28% of all other whites. And we know that voting in the South is racially polarized more than it is in other parts of the country. There are obviously racial splits everywhere, but racial polarization is particularly stark uh, in the uh, Deep South. And so the question is, uh, are white evangelicals voting on the issues they say are primary, or are they actually voting on a whole lot of other conservative issues? Are they voting their, well, their older white, and in many cases, Southern identity? Um, now, I am not in asserting this, and I think that in fairness, uh, one can ask this question of others who aren't white evangelicals. One can ask this of liberals of various kinds, uh, uh, one can ask it of moderate voters. Now, I am not saying that religion does not matter at all uh, in forming people's priorities, for example. Um, uh, otherwise, everybody on this panel would be out of business. Um, you know, and it's clear if you look at some of the referendum campaigns in the country, um, there were some pro-life referendums in Arkansas and elsewhere that were carried. There were. Uh, there was uh, the referendum um, in uh, Florida reenfranchising uh, felons who, former felons who had paid their debts to society, in which a lot of churches uh, were involved. Um, there were many churches involved on the immigration issue. But I think that people are sort of asking the wrong question when they are mystified that white evangelical Christians are voting. Uh, for Donald Trump. Now, some of us, obviously, anybody who reads my column knows I am not a, the biggest fan of our current president. We'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, but, and, and so a lot of people say, well, my gosh, this man does not seem in any way to live by, uh, live in the way that evangelicals say uh, someone should live. Um, and yet, um, Trump simply did about, this, got basically the same 
white evangelical vote as other candidates have gotten uh, pretty much since 2000. Um, you know, really 1976 is the only part as an exception when Jimmy Carter became the first evangelical president in a long time. Um, so uh, in this piece, we closed with uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, line uh, that people did not come to Christianity to understand political issues. They, and this is my word, ransacked Christianity uh, for support for their own uh, political party. Um, and the last piece of data I just want to put on the table, because I think it's something that um, we have to come to terms with. There, there are ways in which, again, all of us adjust some of our views to conform to other parts of our existence. Um, one of the most striking sur uh, survey findings was from the Repub uh, PRI survey back uh, in 2016. Uh, even white evangelicals have been asked for years um, you know, if a candidate's personal life uh, is important to the way they carry out their public duties. Um, as recently as I think 2014, 70% said yes. In 2016, that number had fallen to 30%. It was the most sh striking change of any group in America. And it's just got to be that they decided that they would have to con change their, conform their views on that question in order uh, to vote for Donald Trump. Um, the final thing is, uh, and this has just always been a pet peeve of mine, um, we tend to talk about evangelicals when we're really talking about white evangelicals. Um, the fact is that the African American church has also continued to play a major role in our politics. I was down in um, Georgia uh, covering Stacey Abrams. She is the daughter of two ministers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was fascinating to hear um, scripture kind of a lie in and out of the way she spoke. Uh, and I know that's true of people with politics different than Stacey Abrams, white conservative politicians. Um, and so in saying we're looking at the wrong question, I want to close by saying I'm not denying that faith doesn't matter to a whole lot of people on various sides of the spectrum. Um, but I think we have a lot of thinking to do because I think we're putting our politics, our party, and all kinds of other aspects of our identity ahead mm -hmm. of faith uh, right now, uh, and that we have to come to terms with that. So thank you very, very much. All right. Anybody want to respond to EJ, or, or we can go back to, to the audience? If you, if, all right, well, let's, let's go to more questions. We have, we have Walt will we'll come up here. The, it's coming. Uh. Hi, I'm Walt Grazer. I belong to no prestigious institutions and work out of my basement. Um, <laughs> so uh, That means you, you're believable and trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can you comment a little on the Catholic vote? Have you done some on evangelical? How about a little bit on the Catholic vote? Yeah, I, I've always said there's no Catholic vote and it's important. Um, you know, by way of saying that, that uh, Catholics are almost, a, and I'm curious if Clyde or anyone else wants to jump in, Catholics are a classic 40, 40, 20 group. Um, you know, it's hard to go below 40. But it, it's interesting, the, the Pew data, this is the one place where the needle moved. Uh, in slightly, the sense, it, not well, it, it went from 55, 45 to 50, 50, which, you know, that, that's, that's more movement than in any and other. I guess my question is, was that uh, Latinos or was that white Catholics? Well, and we need to we'll know when interrogate we the data yeah. to yeah. see. Um, uh, and that, but, you know, I, I joke that the Catholic Church's job in politics is to make everybody on every side feel guilty about something. Uh, and the church tends to be doing its job if it makes everyone feel a little guilty. Um, and the, but so Catholics are a 40, 40, 20 group second. They tend to vote for the winner. Uh, which is not probably not the Holy Spirit, but that Catholics are demographically, um, you know, we're about 10% African American, now we're about a third Latino. But here, just to connect Catholics to my previous comments, it really struck me when you looked at um, uh, how Catholics voted in the presidential campaign, um, a majority, uh, not a huge majority, but a pretty substantial majority of white Catholics voted for Donald Trump and a very substantial majority of Latino Catholics voted against Donald Trump for Hillary Clinton. That would suggest to us that they were not, there was not a particular Catholic thing going on there. They were voting 
other aspects of their identity. Now that makes things too simple uh, and in some ways unfair. Like every other group, I think Catholicism does work as a leaven on people's views. I think it makes conservatives more communitarian um, and it makes liberals think more about uh, family issues, have qualms about abortion and like. I think it does have, you know, create some tensions on both sides that can be seen as useful. Um, but again, I think that Latino white number suggests that we, if, you know, those of us who are Catholic should not pretend that Catholicism all by itself uh, is decisive in people's views. I'm curious what your take is on that. Well, I would agree with all that, except uh, if I'm thinking about a 5% shift, um, Latinos that, as a group did not vote strongly more Democratic than they did last time. And I don't think they're 5% more of the Catholic population than they were two years ago. So gradually what's happened over time is whites are leaving the Catholic Church and Latinos are growing as a percentage, but that's a slow growth. So my guess is, I don't have the data, that this represents at least a 4% shift among white Catholics. Because if I, I remember correctly, and I don't have the data in front of me, Latino percentage for, Catholic, uh, for Democrats was the same this time as it was two years ago. So. Eric, you want to I think the one thing I'd mention is to take it in a slightly different way is to talk about this as a, are we seeing a political realignment? And, a, and an al a realignment is about once a generation where the electorate kind of shakes itself out differently than it had been in the past and these new party affiliations stick. So for instance, black Americans voted for the party of Lincoln for 50 or 60 years and then in 1932 as a group, started voting Democrat and, and have since then. And our parties are, the, they're, they're composites of lots of social groups in our pluralistic society. And there's a book called The Great Revolt. It did, it, it did some surveys over the past couple of years. And the argument in that book, I'd recommend it to you, is that, that Trump was really the megaphone he wasn't the leader of it, he was the megaphone or an expression of an of a, of a, of a unusual coalition in the 2016 election. And it may be actually that since 2010 we're seeing a, a, a realignment of different groups in the populace. And that group that, that elected him includes evangelicals, but it also includes a, a, a type of empowered woman, often a CEO, someone who doesn't, who, who, who feels empowered, it feels, like a, a conservative feminist in a sense. It's what we might have called um, Reagan Democrats, workers and things, particularly in the heartland. They, they, they identify seven groups. About a third of that are, are political independents. And so the, the real question is a little bit less about religion as it is could Donald Trump going into the 2020 election, could the Republican Party, can they capture different pieces of the electorate than they used to? And the same thing for the Democratic Party. Can they capture different parts of the electorate than they used to? That, that directly relates to the faith types of issues because it, it ties to different kind of denominational combinations making choices between the, the parties. You know, the life issue, for instance, abortion, et cetera, is one where there's a lot of affinity between uh, black churches and those older white evangelical churches and conservative Catholics and one could imagine voting a certain way among those, that would be a change. Is if, is if 25 or 30%, it's hard to imagine today, but 25 or 30% of black voters flip to the Republican Party on some of those social issues. By the way, Republicans have been hoping for that for a long time. <laughs> but that's what to be looking for as we go to 2020 is can the Republicans reassemble the type of coalition that brought them to power in 2016? Uh, I, well, you want to say something. I, I want I to comment. I was going to take on, an audience question. But go I ahead. just want. I'm a very. I'm a, I'll answer it on another question. I'm a very deep skeptic of that analysis for whole. And those empowered women CEOs sure didn't seem to show up at the polls last. You know, when you looked at college-educated women, I'm sure there are Republican CEOs. The core re Trump vote was conservative Republicans, just like before. Uh, I'll, I'll just well, since I started, I'll make a small point. Um, the only real realignment. Uh, that you saw was among uh, blue collar whites, particularly in the mid-Atlantic states. And one of the things that most struck me about Tuesday was the uh, return of those voters to Democratic candidates. I looked at election returns in Mahoning County, which is Youngstown, what a huge flip mm -hmm. to Trump. 
uh, from Obama. Um, uh, Erie County, Pennsylvania, another blue collar industrial area, huge move. Uh, last Tuesday, Sherrod Brown won Mahoney County by almost very nearly as much as he had won it six years ago. Uh, and Richard Cordray lost the governor's race, but he improved on the Clinton vote. And in, in Erie County, Pennsylvania, um, Casey was equal to Obama and uh, Wolf, the governor, was past Obama. So I think that one of the lessons of this election is to the extent that there was a realigning group, uh, that realignment has not stuck. It doesn't mean Trump can't win some of them back, right. but I think that is the worst news for Trump and the best news for the Democrats out of uh, out of the election. Yeah, I think that's really true. I think, you know, the upper, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, you know, if, if Hillary had flipped the right 40,000 votes within those three states, she'd be president today. And at least to the extent I looked, th th they were bluer this time than they were in 16. Right. Clinton. Ohio is the one that actually has stuck Republican. Yeah. Yeah. That's the state where something may be going on. Yeah. The others kind of return to their old loyalties. So if you, if you look at the exit polls uh, by gender and race, the one group that really moved was white women. Yeah. And they moved by about five points. And um, so, I, and I think part of this is like respect for women and you know, a, a variety of, of kinds of issues. Of course, a lot of women running for office this time and, and a lot of firsts in that regard. But uh, also in terms of realignment stuff, we're getting the real flip on education. So Democrats are carrying college educated and beyond and, and uh, uh, Republicans getting high school and less, uh, and that's a pretty big change from before. Among whites. Yeah. If, if you think about sort of, uh, you know, the coalition, though, the thing to bear in mind is that, so uh, Trump lost by three million uh, votes for the presidency. Uh, in, the, in the aggregate Senate, it's 11 million more votes for Democrats and Republicans. And the, uh, in the House, it's like a nine-point advantage, eight-point yeah. advantage for the Democrats. So the rules of the game that we all play under is electoral college and whatever, right. but in terms of like emerging majorities, which is what we normally think of as realignments, that's not looking so great, right? So yeah. there's, a, there's a need to broaden, I think, on the Republican side. All so. right, let's go to the audience. Uh, very patiently there in the back, and uh, we'll come over Thanks. here to David next. Hi. I'm my name is Cynthia Butler. I'm an attorney, and I'm pretty politically active. Worked on a couple of campaigns. Um, How my, did you do on Tuesday? Well, uh, I well, my team did very well, actually. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> okay. um, but my my question, actually, CJ, um, there was before, just before the election, there was a um, a YouTube video that went around of a priest in the context of a homily who was making the distinction on the life issue. He's basically saying there's something called prudential judgment regarding issues of lifestyle, and then there is this old argument of the cooperation with evil as a basic matter of life, uh, as a theological principle. And my question is, do you, do you think that's a rebuttable argument, or is that a valid theological argument? Because that, coupled with the, the Gosnell movie just before that, had riled up a lot of the conservative base, and there was sort of more screaming hysteria of people saying things like, don't even show up for communion if you're voting, anybody who's a pro-choice woman, et cetera. So I guess from a, from a theological perspective, how would you confront that argument? Well, you're talking to me because I want to hear from our brilliant Episcopalians, which <laughs> whom I have not heard a word from since I got here and because I came late. Could I, I will answer briefly, but I'd love you to come first. I'd just love you, if you would, to talk about, do you mind? I don't want to put sure, you on the sure, spot, yeah. but I, I feel cheated that I have not heard you uh, uh, today. <laughs> there's other things I would be happy to speak about. Um, you know, theologically on that issue, I mean, I, you know, within Roman Catholic theology, obviously I, I can't speak to that. Um, within the Episcopal Church, um, we have policy that is um, very begrudgingly pro-choice, or if you actually look at the language of the resolution that was passed, which is the governing structure of the church, um, it, it, it's very strong moral language about um, the, the moral weight that abortion carries. And also there's a distinction between the public policy um, aspect of what needs to be legal and also what is morally right. And so um, at least as a church, I think the resolution is maybe from the 90s, um, that hasn't become a highly contentious issue within the Episcopal Church, although, of course, there's a huge range of views um, 
of that Episcopalians hold. So in the 115th Congress, there were um, 40 Republicans who were Episcopalian, sorry, 40 members of Congress were Episcopalian, 23 Republicans. I think to a person, all of the Republicans were um, pro-life, and d despite um, one particular Republican who um, has an A for his pro-life record, but then of course in his personal life had some challenges multiple times with abortions. Um, but nevertheless, his voting record was a pro-life record. He's Episcopalian. Um, so, you know, I think that, that just- That said very charitable. There. <laughs> some challenges, right. I like we that. We are yeah. grateful for our, all of our relationships on Capitol Hill. Um, but you know, just a slight comment to the earlier point, and then I will turn back to you, EJ. Um, but in terms of the realignment question that we were just speaking of, I think that's something to remember as well. Whatever the sense of, of many churches, I mean, I think the um, Episcopal Church is one, but I know there's others too. Also, if you look at the membership, I think it's much closer to 50-50 than any particular political realignment. I mean, the Episcopal Church used to be known as Republican Party at prayer. People ask me all the time now, is it the Democratic Party at prayer? And again, I think among Episcopalians, it's really much more split, and I think that the members of Congress reflect that. I'm interested to see in this Congress what the numbers are. I think it's fewer. We had uh, several retirements, some in scandal, um, someone passed away, a few folks lost on Tuesday. So we'll see what that looks like, but I think, again, in terms of the demographic shift of our country, we do have a much more representative Congress in terms of mirroring what our population looks like, which I think is a wonderful thing, something to be celebrated. Um, I also think that that may mean fewer Episcopalians because we're less than 1% of the population. We're about 7% of the former Congress. So I think that that's a historical legacy about kind of mainline denominations having an influence historically in the 1960s when mainline denominations peaked and were more than 50% of the population. Um, th that, I think, is lowering. And so, again, we'll have to adjust to that new reality. Yeah, I'm just gonna give a brief answer and I'm actually gonna do a reference. I wish you, I had known, which I couldn't and you couldn't know, that you were gonna ask that question because I think the person who's written best on this with a point of view that I agree with is Kathy Cavaney, who's a great uh, theologian as well as law professor uh, up at BC, um, who is very critical of the use of intrinsic evil uh, to basically uh, to sort of set apart one or two issues in Catholic teaching from all mm -hmm. others. And that is, that is my feeling. I think that one can make a case. Father, you could probably do a better job on this but than I we could. Have yeah, we have an expert. Yeah, we have, I have, a, but when I, whenever I see a Jesuit nod, I figure maybe I'm on the right track. But I, um, that there, I, I think there is a, a problem with a kind of narrow casting of the concept uh, of intrinsic evil. Is it an intrinsic evil to separate children from their parents at the border, for example? Um, and that's why I think that uh, um, you know, Pope Francis has brought back a language similar to the seamless garment language that the late Cardinal Bernadine uh, used back in the 80s and 90s, which says there is a link among issues for people who are concerned with life, a link between abortion and war and peace and the death penalty and support uh, for the poor. Um, last quick point, I've argued for a while that I believe that the centerpiece of the politics should not be making abortion illegal, uh, it should be to reduce the number of abortions uh, in the country and I think there are a lot of things that we could do to reduce the incidence of abortion, which would also, by the way, involve supporting women, children, and families, which is something I think we want to do anyway for moral reasons. But I'll be happy to talk to you more, but I, I wish I had, I wish I could pull Kathy out of the other room because she could give you a better answer than I can. So let me say, actually, I was gonna call on David Hollenbach anyway, so let me give you an option, ask your original question or follow up on this one. You, you, so you, it, it, the question's for you. Uh, we need the microphone here to David in the uh, third row. By the way, David is the author of an idea which we should all think a lot about, the idea of intellectual solidarity, uh, which we need a lot more of in our country right now. I suggest you look up his wonderful writing on this concept. Right, well anyway, that's all about taking each other seriously and learning from each other in a way that is not just solidarity from a social, economic point of view, but from taking each other's idea, ideas into account and so forth. And I think 
that's very important on this debate about abortion, which that's not happening at all. We need to listen to each other and find out what different people on both sides of these issues are really communicating and why they're, why they're so passionate about them and so forth. Anyway, that's, uh, but I do think along the lines that E.J. mentioned that, that uh, taking these questions into account on the level of public policy can't be done adequately by looking simply at saying certain actions are always wrong. You have to look at the political dynamics of what the social situation calls for and what the law might imply and a whole series of things of that sort that, anyway, I agree with the direction that you were going. I'd like to raise a question, though, which was stimulated by something that you said earlier, and it was related to some of the other panelists, namely the reconfiguration of some of the votes in the northeast of the United States. Um, Pennsylvania is my home state. And there was clearly a shift from a state that voted marginally, but nonetheless really for Trump uh, the last time, right. to a pattern of voting that really didn't go with Trump's agenda at all in terms of local politicians within the state and so forth. And this is not only Pennsylvania, it's some of the other parts of the Northeast and, and the Rust Belt and so forth, maybe not Ohio, but elsewhere. <clears throat> what do you think's causing that? Um, is this because people who thought that Trump was going to help them economically are now disappointed that the tax cuts are benefiting rich, rich people rather than working class people? Or I, I'm, I'm interested to know what you think is causing this. Re you would probably say it's not religion. It's got something to do with with some of the dynamics of economics or social, social dynamics. But I'm very interested to know what you think is causing that reconfiguration. I and mean, we saw an article, I forget it was the Times or the Post this morning, say, saying that um, the Northeast was a disaster for the Republican Party in this recent election. And uh, whether you think that's really true, and if so, why? What's causing it? Uh, this reconfiguration of voting patterns in that area. It didn't, it didn't change the Senate's overall composition, but it changed them, some other people in the, in the House and so forth. So, Clyde, you want to take a shot at yeah, that? Yeah, could I have, I've, I've yapped so much, it's like I was contained in the back of that Uber, and now I can't <laughs> shut up, so I don't want to. Would it be possible, I'd love to take a crack at that, but I'd love to hear from other people before I speak again, if that's possible. Especially if we're toward the end. Are yeah, we? we're, we're, this is our last question. So, uh, so could I, could yeah. I, uh, I, I don't want to be the last word. I just well, want to we'll, let everybody else speak. We'll, we'll run, we'll, we'll give everybody the last shot. Here. Oh, so okay. go, so um, go ahead. Um, just real quick on that question. Um, number one, I do think that the, the Democrats run, ran a very intelligent campaign focused on economics, healthcare first, jobs and job training second. Um, and they, they, in some cases, they made the job training issue populist. There was a great ad by Richard Cordray, who failed in Ohio, where it wasn't a politician lecturing people who are losing their jobs, well, you gotta go back to school. He flipped it around and said, you shouldn't have to go to college to join the middle class, uh, which I think is a much more promising way of arguing, we can't bring all those jobs back, but we do have an obligation to uh, lift people up and give them other opportunities. So I think that agenda was helpful. I think the tax cut was very unpopular. It didn't, um, um, you know, it clearly did not move many voters Republicans' way. It kept some of their, well, you know, some of the affluent base, but it sure didn't reach out, um, reach out to others. I think also Trump may be getting bitten by the very thing that bit Hillary Clinton, that we were pretty affluent uh, as a country. We had a lot of economic growth under Obama, um, in fact, what's striking is the two years of Trump are very similar to the two years of Obama. Democrats like to show, actually, there were a few more jobs created under Obama, but basically, we had four years that were pretty good. But what we heard in, 19, in 2016 was there are a lot of people hurting, even though the economy is doing well. Guess what? A lot of those same people have still not uh, moved forward. And then the last point is some of it is Trump didn't shake all of the residual loyalties that were there, that it's an interesting question, and we don't know the answer to this yet. Was Trump a kind of one-off protest 
Uh, and also, a lot of voters just didn't like Hillary Clinton. Um, that wasn't my personal view, but there clearly, um, by on election day, 60% of voters had a negative view of Trump, 55% had a negative view of Clinton. Uh, if you put those together, it meant 17% of the voters who cast ballots, according to the exit poll, had a negative view of both of them. Those voters voted 47-30 for Trump. Hillary Clinton wasn't on the ballot in 2018, and I think that also uh, made a difference. So I think all those things had something to do with it. Clyde, you want you know, to know, I think there's an interesting contrast between, say, New Hampshire and West Virginia. So I'm from West Virginia, and West Virginia is Trump country. Uh, three of the strongest counties for Trump are in West Virginia. And he came in and he said he's going to restore the, the coal jobs. Oh, and, uh, and, and at one point we were up 100, <laughs> and now we're, now we're up five um, because a couple of the coal mines have changed. But it's still Trump country, right? And they still love him, right? Mansion won. Yeah, Ma Mansion won. And, uh, but Mansion's a long time political yeah. dynasty there. Yeah. He ran a really cool ad, by the way. He, sh he shot a gun at repeal efforts of the ACA. You know, but um, that's but really you know. the, the greatest crossover. Exactly in right. He's, he's putting himself in the West Virginia culture. But in New Hampshire, the Democrats just swept. Right? They took over the state legislature yeah. and whatever. I'm not really sure what the, what the difference between the two is, but I'm going to ponder that. The one thing I'd say about why Trump wins, though, only once in my lifetime, I'm 65, have we had the same party in power three elections in a row. Right? Reagan, Reagan, Bush. That's the only time. So two, two elections, we're almost always changing parties, right? And so someone comes in, he sounds a little different, let's shake it up a little bit. And so, um, he, and, and when, he's, uh, when he's running again, he'll probably do slightly better than he, than he but he, I don't think he's wearing well, so. Yeah, so I'm gonna not talk about that. I'm gonna, can I say something more back up about religion and the political parties? And so much of our conversation tonight has been about uh, people of faith choosing either Democrat or Republican, right? And that's actually not the only choice that's there. There's the choice to step out of the political process entirely. And so it's worth noting that uh, particularly among younger evangelicals and some others that there's been talk for the past two years about a Benedict option. An option that, and it was hinted at a little bit earlier, that says, you know, we really don't trust politics either way. We don't trust politicians. The system is corrupt, et cetera. Our society has changed. And so for a variety of reasons, either moral reasons or political reasons, et cetera, we're gonna opt out of the system entirely. And so that's really a question for both political parties is are younger people who have a, a, a high affect for lived religion are those conservative religionists, I don't mean that they're politically conservative, I mean that they're, they're practicing their faith, are they going to continue to show up at the polls and vote? Are they gonna to continue to give money? Are they gonna write letters, et cetera? Will they run for office? Or is that group going to increasingly decide to step out of the political process altogether? And that, that is big, depending on who that is, and, and, and those have typically been right-leaning or GOP-leaning young people, if they choose to leave, it's going to be even more of this of this of the of the type of trend that we've heard about from Clyde and from EJ earlier. Could I just say a miraculous thing? The book that we discussed in my class today, this morning at the Harvard Divinity School, was Rod Dreher's The Benedict Option. That's so cool. something's yeah. floating around. It was a great discussion. It was not a kind of book normally read at the Harvard Divinity School. It was really quite fun to have this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Rebecca. Is this last word or this is it, yeah. So that may be the case. I mean, I, I think it's definitely worth considering and being aware of, but just again, to see that the turnout of this election was higher than in decades and decades, and this is a midterm, uh, we'll see what the sense is. I mean, one interesting dynamic coming out of Tuesday's election is that both sides are able to claim some kind of victory. Um, you know, I watched the Heritage Foundation's video last night, and they're ready for the lame duck and ready for the next Congress, and they've got a plan, and you know, this was a victory, and they counted up their victories. You know, and again, I think we're seeing that on the Democratic side as well, um, and that there, that may actually, that salvaging may allow um, people to stay motivated and engaged. Um, I'd also say that uh, something I didn't mention in the beginning, but that for all the um, organizing and getting out the vote and trying to mobilize people to vote their values and their consciences that you're finding among um, mainline denominations and folks who are more traditionally considered on the progressive or religious left, 
um, everything that I both experienced as a faith-based advocate myself and then in working in coalition with others, um, it was about kind of more grassroots, outreach, occasionally some big events and rallies and things, but um, this idea that we could persuade by having our bishops and leadership speak about the importance of the issue. What's happening on um, the more conservative side is that the Faith and Freedom Coalition spent $18 million in this election to mobilize the vote. In the 2016 election, they spent $10 million, and before that, $5 million. So that's some real dollars, and that's different. I haven't seen anything like that equivalent among um, other tr religious traditions, so I just think we also need to be aware that in addition to the public discourse level, where I think there can be so much enthusiasm and passion and excitement with young people and diversity and having all these incredible new firsts in Congress that we want to celebrate, um, also realizing there is a focus and sustained effort, I think, among some groups who are looking at issues that aren't just the what's bubbling up around kind of immigration and the kind of some of the really racist rhetoric that's been deployed, but these other issues again about the courts, longer term strategy that that is um, unwavering and trying to meet some policy objectives that that aren't always caught in the news cycles. Let me add. A, a quirky footnote to Pennsylvania. I think the redistricting helped. Oh, yeah. So you drew, you went from safe districts where otherwise interesting Democrats said there's no way that I, I can run and win. When the redistricting came, I, what there were five gained, five seats gained in the Pennsylvania uh, uh, congressional delegation. I think that attracted better candidates and more money and you were able to activate more grassroots voters across the state, whereas if it had been the status quo, a lot of Democrats would have said, there's nothing we can do because the districts are safe districts. Mm -hmm. I think that made a difference, <clears throat> although what was striking is that happened all over the country. I mean, something you saw in this election is Dem or were Democrats waging serious campaigns in places that oh, they yeah. hadn't waged them without any reapportionment. But but the, the difference was by changing them into competitive districts, I think you got better candidates, you got more money, and so that, that was a magnifying effect over what was happening nationally. Uh, so uh, two closing announcements. announcements. We, we have uh, a reception, refreshments outside, so please uh, partake of that. But please join me uh, in thanking the panel. Thank you.